This is the second part of capacitor introductory, where we will learn about how to calculate the charge, voltage and current. Then we will talk about the types of capacitors where we already know that there are electrolytic caps and non-electrolytic ones. And we will see how to calculate the total capacitance when capacitors are placed either in series or parallel. So let's get started. Alright, so capacitor's capacitance tells you how much charge it can store, right? How much charge a capacitor is currently storing depends on the potential difference, which is the voltage, between its plates. This relationship between charge, capacitance and voltage can be modeled with the following equation. Honestly, I never had to use this equation before, but it's good to know that it exists. So the capacitance of a capacitor should always be constant, a known value. And uh, so we can adjust voltage to increase or decrease the cap's charge. More voltage means more charge, less voltage, less charge. The equation also gives us a good way to define the value of 1 farad. So 1 farad is the capacitance to store 1 unit of energy, which is measured in coulombs, per every 1 volt. We can take the charge voltage capacitance equation to a step further, to find out how capacitance and voltage affect current, because current is the rate of flow of charge. It's very important for you to know that all capacitors, regardless of their type, will block DC current to pass through. I mean, they will let DC current but only until they are charged up, while AC current will always pass through. The amount of current through a capacitor depends on both the capacitance and how quickly the voltage is rising or falling. If the voltage across a capacitor swiftly rises, a large positive current will be induced through the capacitor. A slower rise in voltage across a capacitor equates to a smaller current through it. In case of DC, where the voltage across a capacitor is steady and unchanging, no current will go through it. The equation for calculating the current through a capacitor is the following, where dV over dt is the derivative, which is a fancy way of saying instantaneous rate of voltage over time. It's equivalent to saying how fast is voltage going up or down at this very moment. The big takeaway from this equation is that if voltage is steady, the derivative is zero, which means current is also zero. And this is why current cannot flow through a capacitor holding a steady DC voltage. You might find this equation kinda ugly, and that's true, it also gets into calculus. But you have to know that it's not necessary to know until you get into tandem in analysis, filter design and other stuff, so don't worry about this for the moment. But what you have to worry about is that there are all sorts of capacitor types out there, each with certain features and drawbacks, which makes it better for some applications than others. When deciding on capacitor types, there are a handful of factors to consider. The first one is the size, which uh, where the size, both in terms of uh, physical volume and the capacitance, it's not uncommon for a capacitor to be the largest component in a circuit. They can also be very tiny. More capacitance typically requires a larger capacitor. The next factor is maximum voltage. So each capacitor is rated for a maximum voltage that can be dropped across it. Some capacitors might be rated for 1.5 volts, others might be rated for 100 volts. Exceeding the maximum voltage will usually result in destroying the capacitor. The next factor to consider is the leakage current. Well, capacitors are not perfect. In fact, there is no component that is perfect. So every capacitor is prone to leaking some tiny amount of current through the dielectric from one terminal to another. And this tiny current loss, which is usually nanoamps or less, is called leakage current. Well, leakage causes energy stored in the capacitor to slowly but surely drain away. The next factor to consider is the equivalent series resistance, which is abbreviated as ESR. Well, in the previous course I mentioned that because there is no ideal capacitor, the capacitor itself has a resistance inside of it. The terminals of a capacitor are not 100% conductive, 
they will always have a tiny amount of resistance, usually less than 0.01 ohm to them. And this resistance becomes a problem when a lot of current runs through the capacitor, producing heat and power loss. The last thing to consider is the tolerance. Well, capacitors also can be made to have an exact, precise capacitance. Each capacitor will be rated for their nominal capacitance, but depending on the type, the exact value might vary anywhere from plus minus 1% to plus minus 20% of the desired value. Alright, so the first type of capacitor that we are going to talk about is the ceramic capacitors. The most commonly used and produced capacitor out there is the ceramic capacitor, and the name comes from the material from which their dielectric is made. So ceramic capacitors are usually both physically and capacitance-wise small. It's hard to find a ceramic capacitor much larger than uh, 10 microfarads. A surface mount ceramic cap is commonly found in a tiny 0402, 0603 or 0805 package. Through hole ceramic capacitors usually look like small, commonly yellow or red bulbs with two legs of equal length. Compared to the equally popular electrolytic capacitors, ceramics are a more near ideal capacitor, which means that they have much lower ESR and leakage currents, but their small capacitance can be limiting. They are usually the least expensive option too, and these capacitors are well suited for high frequency coupling and decoupling applications, which we will talk about more in the future course. On the other hand, electrolytics are great because they can pack a lot of capacitance into a relatively small volume. If you need a capacitor in the range of 1 microfarad until 1 millifarad, you are most likely to find it an electrolytic form. They are especially well suited to high voltage applications because of their relatively high maximum voltage ratings. Aluminum electrolytic capacitors, the most popular and electrolytic family, usually look like little tin cans with uh, both leads extending from the bottom. Unfortunately, electrolytic capacitors are usually polarized. So they have a positive pin, the anode, and a negative pin called the cathode. When voltage is applied to an electrolytic capacitor, the anode must be at a higher voltage than the cathode. The cathode of an electrolytic capacitor is usually identified with a minus marking and a colored strip on the case. Also, the leg of the anode might also be slightly longer as another, which is another indication. If voltage is applied in reverse on an electrolytic capacitor, they will blow up, so make sure you connect them in the correct way. After blowing up, an electrolytic capacitor will behave just like a short circuit. These electrolytic capacitors are also notorious for leakage, meaning that they will allow small amount of currents in the order of nanoamps to run through the dielectric from one terminal to the other. And this makes electrolytic caps less than ideal for energy storage, which is unfortunate given their high capacity and voltage rating.